السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إخوتي وأخواتي أود أن أعرفكم على ضيف اليوم اسمه مخلص ما كيف حالك؟ الحمد لله بخير تشرفت بكم وفرصة سعيدة أن أكون معكم ما شاء الله ما شاء الله مخلص أخونا من أصله من الصين وهو مقيم معنا في أستراليا حتى ولدت في أستراليا ونشأت هنا ما شاء الله So in case you're wondering why we're speaking Arabic my beloved brother مخلص ما is a brother you may have seen on some of our One Path videos in the past. Mukhlis Ma is one of my personal friends, someone I love dearly, and someone who has actually grasped the Arabic language a lot better than most Arabs, myself included. Mukhlis, tell us a bit about yourself. So Alhamdulillah, I was born in Sydney. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents uh, both migrated from overseas, and they have a pretty interesting story themselves because uh, we're ethnically Chinese. Yeah. So both parents are originally from China. But none of them were born in China. My mother was born in, in Pakistan when um, my grandfather actually fled China mm -hmm. over the Himalayas into Pakistan. Mm -hmm. He was studying there when my mother was born. And my father originally is from China, but he was born and brought up in Burma. So if we go back through your generation, the Ma generation, how far back would you say Islam was prevalent amongst your family line? Um, so I don't actually really know how far back it goes. Mm -hmm. But what I do know is that, alhamdulillah, the family has been Muslim as far back as we know. Because wow. all branches of them are Muslim. SubhanAllah. Yes. So we're talking about like a, a proper Islamic history in China. Yeah. What's the history of Islam like in China? So the history of Islam in China is quite old in the sense that uh, there, there were people that came, uh, you know, spreading Islam just as merchants and, and, and so forth, quite from early, the early stages of Islam. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it seems like that Islam took a, a greater hold in China uh, once there were sort of uh, interactions with Muslims in Central Asia, uh, especially with like army and political things happening. Mm -hmm. And that, that pretty much allowed Muslims to settle. And we, ha we actually have now 10 different ethnicities of Muslims in China. Wow. So I'm like of the Hui ethnicity. And that's probably the ethnicity that's closest to the majority of China, which is Han Chinese. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're very, very integrated in that so way. I remember I went to Guangzhou once mm -hmm. and there was a lot of talk that they said there's a mosque in there that was built or, or something to do with Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. And I don't know how true that is, yeah. but w would you know anything about that? So I try to look it up a bit and mm -hmm. it seems that there's no evidence of mm -hmm. it you know, actually happening there. And you know, some people even go as far as saying that he died there, yeah. uh, which contradicts like the other historical reports that we know that he's buried in Al Baqi in Medina. Oh wow! Well, yeah. So I don't think it's it's maybe it's a, just like a folk tale or something like that. I guess, but although we can't, we can say all right, it probably wasn't him. But can we say like Tabi'een? Yeah, or? definitely. From oh, the wow. early days, there were there were sort of convoys, mm -hmm. and it seems like that they did have respect for Islam because you know they they did build such early mosques. Mm. But um, I'd say Islam sort of uh, got a hold in China a bit later on. I actually, I remember reading a poem. I'm not sure how authentic this is because there's a lot of stuff that goes around on social media. There was yeah. a poem of, a, I think, a Chinese emperor mm. praising the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Are you familiar yeah. with that? Yeah, so that's in the Ming dynasty. And they say that that was like the Muslim dynasty in the sense that there was a lot of favor towards Muslims. That's when we had the famous Muslim explorer Zheng He, who like explored most of the world and, uh, and, and was Muslim. And, um, you know, there are even theories that the emperor was, in fact, secretly a Muslim. SubhanAllah. But I, I, don't, I don't think that's true. It's the emperor far was secretly Muslim. Yeah, well, that's a beautiful thing to, to come across something like that. And now with yourself, when did you start saying, I want to learn the Arabic language? You mm. know, at what point in your life did you say, hang on, you know, I really want to learn this Arabic language? Yeah. So Alhamdulillah, like, I had a pretty good foundation that my parents gave me in the sense that they had taught me how to read the Quran well. And I had learned from really good teachers in the sense that my pronunciation was good. I'd memorized a little bit of the Quran. And, you know, we, we had little trials of Arabic, but never really succeeded, you know, in primary school and so forth. Mm. And just later on, when I was attending university, I started to feel that drive towards Arabic. Mm. And for me, part, part of it was just the hypocrisy of saying, you know, I'm this Muslim who worships Allah in Arabic. And, you know, I value the Qur'an, I love the Qur'an. But that hypocrisy in the very little effort was put on my regards, or maybe even generally in the community, with respect to Arabic. Mm. So just that hypocrisy drove me to say, I really want to focus on that. And for me, just the mindset that I took while going into Arabic was, 
um, it was a very like science, mathematical, logical mindset. And I really yeah. loved it. Yeah. You know, it stuck with me. I said, this is actually really cool. Subhanallah. Yeah. You actually reminded me like, I remember studying Arabic and it exactly is that. It's, it's, it's mathematical. Where you're doing Arab of a sentence and you're thinking, all right, um, if inna or anna or walakinna, and then you go, then the next word has to be a fatha and this and that. And it's just like you're doing algebra, but in reality, you're just speaking Arabic. And it's got that beautiful mathematical factor towards it. So, how long did it take you till you started to get, I guess, a hold of things in terms of the Arabic language? Yeah, so I was studying Arabic part time throughout university, probably for a good four years. Mm. And I got to the stage where I could speak relatively fluently and, and read quite well and then later on I decided to I want to pursue that, pursue that further mm -hmm. so really just being somewhat disciplined over a large period of time say something like four years mm. um, and I achieved quite good proficiency and this was all all in Australia I didn't go overseas to learn Arabic because you actually hear that a lot Arabic is a very hard language and you know probably from what I just said many people get the impression that it is hard mm. what, what are your thoughts on that Look, that's, pro that's a very, very problematic statement mm. because it's basically contradicting Allah's promise in the Qur'an. Like the Qur'an has been made easy, Allah's promise it's easy. Mm. And, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, the, 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 uh, he doesn't send a messenger except with the language of the people. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet وسلم, with the language of his people, which was Quraysh, mm. but we're also his people. Mm -hmm. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically saying This is our language This is the language of our ummah It's what it should be But you know We haven't reached that level yet yeah. And we also know that it's the, it's the language of Jannah That's so true subhanAllah So you're saying in four years You got a grasp of the language You've been able to speak fluently in the language And I guess were there hurdles in the way? Were there challenges? Yeah definitely Because the, I didn't have one teacher throughout the whole thing I tried many different teachers Different techniques Different books and different people telling me different things. Mm. You know, I didn't, didn't really have a very clear focus. And I think if I had that clear focus, I could have done it in much less time with less effort. I hope you're enjoying the discussion so far. If you haven't subscribed already to our YouTube channel, please do so by clicking subscribe and hitting the bell. Also, if you are enjoying this podcast, please consider heading over to our website at onepathnetwork.com and contributing whatever you can. Any donation will be greatly appreciated. Let's continue. What advice would you give to be to someone who's, I guess, starting out the Arabic uh, pursuit of knowledge? Yeah. Um, obviously, the first thing that you have to do is to have the right intention. Mm -hmm. So you're not learning this necessarily as a language that's going to increase your business opportunities or, you know, give you a better career prospect. But, you know, you're learning it for the reason of the Quran. And that has to motivate you to be disciplined with it. Because it's going to be hard, you know, you're going to have to wake up early on a Sunday morning to give yourself an extra hour of Arabic. And you have to have that motivation. And you have to have that right intention from the beginning. And that allows you to, to be consistent for that certain amount of time. So that's the first thing. Mm. And uh, I suppose attached to that is just realize that it's not something that you can do in a few months. It needs to be something that you give a regular amount of time for a certain number of years and you'll reach somewhere. Because you actually, you, you see that a lot. I, I think, I guess on YouTube, there's some videos. I learned this language in seven days. And we hear of the Sahaba. I think, I forgot who it was. He, he learned Hebrew in, in 17 days. Yeah. And then and then you hear about that. Maybe I can do it in, in a very quick, short amount of time. But w w what are your thoughts on that? Look, basically your aim is not to just grasp parts of the language mm. such that you, maybe you're able to decipher a little bit of reading or something like that. You really want to have a natural flow with the language, you want to have good language ability, you want to understand like that, the Quran as an Arab. Mm -hmm. And that's going to take time for you to develop. But the most important thing is that you need to ensure that you're just getting a very, very large amount of input. Everything is about input. We're talking about vocabulary. So it, no, not necessarily in a direct way. So what input means is that you're listening to Arabic and you're reading Arabic. And you just increase those two. Obviously, you have to start with something at a suitable level. It has to be comprehensible. But you need to find something interesting. And you need to just increase the amount that you're listening and the amount that you're reading. So that might be that you follow a series because that will, that will make you read. And if your teacher teaches it in Arabic, you'll listen. But you just need to learn it in that very, very natural way. Because if you learn something in a direct way, so if you learn and you say, here's a list of vocabulary, I'm going to memorize the English translation of it or I'm going to learn all of these grammar rules, 
I found that number one, some people can't learn that way. It's very difficult. Some people can learn that way. And the people that can learn that way always forget. Mm. So it's not an effective way of learning because like you need to, you need to have the most efficient way of learning because obviously your time is important. So the most efficient way is just to naturally learn and increase your input. Even not forcing yourself to speak. You don't have to even force yourself to write. Those things are going to come naturally. You just need to have a very, very large amount of good input. SubhanAllah. And I guess it's a beautiful thing. And especially, I guess most of our viewers, when they see a beautiful Chinese brother speaking this Arabic language, number one, it does come as a shock. But at the same time, you have to know it's hard work. And and through this hard work, you'll get this, I guess, the keys to Islam and, 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 and the language of the Quran, you'll be able to grasp. But Mukhlis, I wanted to actually draw something on you. There's, uh, there's a lot of, I guess, talk and hype on social media when it comes to non-Arabs embracing Islam, non-Arabs speaking Arabic, and there's a wow factor towards it. We see, I think, YouTubers like Dawood Kim, I think he's a, a South Korean, yeah. he's a South Korean, embraces Islam, he goes viral. There's that wow factor towards it. We even seen, I think, there's a TikToker, his name is uh, Falafu Kimchi. I wanted to actually play one of his videos and I wanted to get your thoughts on it. You have a sling in here, huh? Yo, let's rob him. Oh, oh sh**! It's Falafel Kimchi! Sometimes. No. When? Wallah, you took No, I'm not Yeah. I swear it's not with me. When? How do you use it on me? Sure. Dog, yeah! Yeah! That's the guy who's... Yo, I seen him? I'm like... Yeah, subhanAllah. So I guess... There is that wow factor, and that's why we see people like this, they go viral over TikTok, over Instagram. Why do you think people are drawn to something like that? It's probably just like orientalization and sort of, uh, it's like, oh, wow, you know, look at, look at this, the, these people and, mm. you know, they're able to achieve something that maybe I didn't achieve. Yeah. But for me, it's always been something that's a bit like, I have this bad feeling in my heart towards it because it's sort of like, you know, people put you on this pedestal and they make a big deal out of it. At the end of the day, I grew up a very similar upbringing to you. Mm -hmm. We grew up in Sydney. We went to like school, like Islamic schools to start with. And you know, we, we probably had very similar opportunities. There's nothing very special about me doing it. And mm -hmm. if, you actually, if you actually look in the Arab world, there are many, many Chinese that can speak Arabic very fluently. It's probably, yeah. So it's not really anything that special, but I suppose just the, the, the wow factor, you know, I suppose even the, the the social the approach to social media is that you have to find something different, and yeah, that that's what unique. yeah that's right yeah and 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 the truth is I guess when as you said you know people in 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 Arab world and might not be an Arab origin but they're speaking Arabic fluently and when we look in the history of Islam we see that many non Arabs had great contributions towards the Arabic language towards Islam in and of itself and it's like something which is a part of our history yeah so what we see is that. It's actually because the non-Arabs had a need towards Arabic. So, you know, is Islam started as an Arab thing in the sense that everyone that became Muslim in the early stages had this crazy strong Arabic. And as it spread out, you found that these people that became Muslim later on were not Arabs and didn't feel that same connection. Mm. And a lot of them were, were especially slaves. So you find that, you know, amongst the Tabi'in, Tabi'in, tabi there's this sla slave class of scholar because they felt that I needed to have that stronger connection to Arabic. So they actually spent a lot of time learning the Arabic and becoming very proficient in it. And that's why you get someone like Sibuwe that would come up and become the greatest grammarian of all time. Um, and he's non-Arab, but that's because he had to do that. You know, you don't have an Arab that lived in the desert and had amazing Arabic that needed to do what Sibuwe did. He didn't need, to, like the Arab doesn't need to classify everything and work up all these theories but the non-Arab needed to do that. So it was, a, it was a point of need. And the reality is that most of the world now has that need as well. I'm talking about the Muslim world in the sense that you're non-Arab that you can't speak Fusha. Even though you know, your lineage, you, know, you might come from Arab parents and you might have a, this ancestry of, of um, you know, people speaking Arabic, but you yourself are non-Arab from the, 
I suppose, the your tongue. Yeah, I guess there, there was this really, really funny video I was doing the rounds on Instagram of this brother. He actually said that same point. He goes, when you're going to Egypt to learn Arabic, and then he goes, you walk into the store. I think we should actually play the video. And, and you go to buy fruit and you're like, what do you do when I study kilo of tomato? And then the, the, the stop short owner, he looks at you and he says, Sadaqallah al he goes, he goes, brother, I'm not even reading the Quran. But he goes, just by the way you're speaking this fusha, people will think that you're reading the Quran because that's not the norm there. Classical Arabic is, is, is not the norm in, in, in Arab society now. They're speaking their own um, dialect. And so I guess what you're saying is true that if you're going to learn this fusha, it hasn't really got this dunyawi um, maslaha. It hasn't got this dunya-oriented uh, benefit. Rather, if you want to learn classical Arabic, you've got to be sincere that this is for Islam, this is for Allah. Yeah, And that's a really cool thing because it's known now that English is the language of the dunya. Yeah. You know, basically, if you want to do well in this dunya, regardless of where you are, you're in like China, you're in uh, the Middle East, you're in South America, you need to learn English. Mm. But it's also known that we have the language of the Akhirah as well, which is Arabic. And you need to learn Arabic, but it's just like that deception that we have of this dunya. Mm. You know, it's, it, it's, it's immediate, it's in front of us, it's the closest thing to us. And it's what the shaitan tries to push us towards. It's what even our, ourselves try to push us ourselves towards. Then, you know, we focus on that and we sort of like ignore the other section and then, you know, it becomes too late. Well, and, and, and what you're saying is true. Like you look into the... The, the non-English world, they're struggling, really striving to just learn English, watching Hollywood movies, doing anything to learn the, the English language because it's the language of the dunya. This is the language that will get you places in life. And there was actually a famous sheikh, um, Sheikh Abdul Rashid Sufi. He was walking and he was walking with his books and, and they said, where are you going? He goes, I'm going to go learn English. And then he goes, why do you want to learn English? He goes, oh, it's for the dunya. And then I think one of the elders told him, Look at, look at my street. I own the whole street and it's filled with shops and this and that. And he goes, I don't even know English. He goes, if you want the dunya, come memorize the Quran. Allah will give you the dunya. He says, man kana yuridu thawab al-dunya fa'inda Allahi thawab al-dunya wal-akhira. Wa hadha huwa al-tafsiru fi qawli Allahi ta'ala man kana yuridu thawab al-dunya fa'inda Allahi thawab al-dunya wal-akhira. And you mentioned previously before that it was actually a very interesting uh, point that you made when you said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he wasn't sent except in the language of the people and that practically if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent to us this could be you know our language as well Arabic it could be our language as well can you draw any other wisdoms as to why the, the Quran was revealed in Arabic? Because there's just, I guess, so much to say when it comes to this language. Yeah. Look, if you look at it from a logical point of view, the Quran has to have been revealed in one language. We couldn't have had the Quran revealed in multiple languages because just the nature of different languages would give different meanings. Mm. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose it to be one language. And the other point that the Quran makes is that it has to have come upon the language of the Prophet Wasallam. You know? How could it be a, a prophet that is Arab but speaking a non-Arab language? Mm -hmm. And also it has to come to the, the language of the, the people that it's, it's sent to immediately. So first it had to have come uh, with Arabic language uh, and that was, that was Quraysh, you know, the, 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 the language of Quraysh. So logically it has, to be, it has to have come in a certain language, right? Why didn't it come in the language that then became the most popular language in the dunya? That's a hikmah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made. And that's why I challenge that perception of Arabic being a difficult language because Allah has to have made Arabic an easy language. Mm. It's an easy language because Allah didn't send it down in that language and then make it impossible for people to decipher. He made it possible for everyone to decipher, right? You just have to put in the effort. Mm. And even like when we see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, I was given jawami al-kalim. I was given comprehensive speech. And even when you look at that, you know, that statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he was given this comprehensive speech, you know, personally when I look at it, I feel like 
Arabic is the only language that can encompass that comprehensive speech. So when he says one statement in Arabic, when it comes to translating it, not to mention explaining the wisdoms of it, you need so many sentences in English. Yeah, because Arabic is a very technical language. And in that sense, there's many things that can go on, can go on. So there could have been something that's added or something that's removed. It could be something that's put forward or put back. There could be, you know, all sorts of different things where you can say the same thing, but you can say it with more emphasis. You can say it with less emphasis. You can say it in, in so many different ways. And all those possibilities allow it to, to really shine out that this is a divine speech. You can see the, the preciseness of something uh, when there are so, so many of these very calculated possibilities, but all of them are uh, eliminated except one. SubhanAllah. And when we look at, I guess, linguistic miracles of the Qur'an that are delivered through this, you know, the, the techniques of Arabic, SubhanAllah, it's, it's a beautiful thing, you know. Yeah. But yeah, MashaAllah, that's, that's, that's something, I guess, all of us really need to, I guess, dive into this Arabic language and, and try to attain it as much as you can. I know even some of the ulama of the past, they used to say this is fard, you know, to learn the, the language of Arabic and, and, and really utilize it because it can take you places in this deen. It's mm -hmm. like the key to the sciences of Islam. Yeah, it's a very, very enjoyable language. Once you get to read Arabic, you feel that it's a very emotional language, very expressive language, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even a very romantic language. SubhanAllah. And I think the, the ultimate reason is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose it and he's very, very proud that the Qur'an is Arabic because if you look at the Qur'an itself as a text, itself in the Qur'an brags that the Qur'an is Arabic. Like it's such a strange thing, right? So you have a normal book and it's an English book and you're reading and you know, the author doesn't point out, by the way, this book is revealed in pure English. Yeah. No, it's not. Uh, this book is actually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it so many times. وَإِنَّهُ لَتَنزِيلُ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْأَمِينَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُنذِرِينَ بِلِسَانٍ عَرَبِيٍ مُبِينَ You know, a clear Arabic tongue. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, you know, in a few ayat later on, وَلَوْ نَزَّلْنَاهُ عَلَىٰ بَعْضِ الْأَعْجَمِينَ فَقَرَأُهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مَا كَانُوا بِهِ مُؤْمِنِينَ So, like, if Allah revealed this Arabic book to these non-Arabs, then they wouldn't believe in it. And the Prophet Sallallahu if he himself with all his akhlaq and, and just like the haybah that he has, if he himself read it to these non-Arabs, they wouldn't have believed in it, right? So if you, if you actually think that might, that might have been me, like I'm, I'm like a non-Arab if I can't speak Arabic and I wouldn't have believed in it. Basically, you need to have that connection with Arabic to be able to believe in the Quran. Yeah, subhanAllah. And there's like just so much more to it. Even like we talk, talk about like tajweed, the rules of tajweed how they specifically make the Arabic language sound so beautiful to the ears. Like there's just, we can go on and on about the, the beauty of this Arabic language, subhanAllah, and, and how it, you know, decorates the Quran, subhanAllah. Mukhlis, I want to take you back. Before you went to Medina, before you started getting into your bachelor's of Arab, Arabic language and diving deep into the Arabic language, you went ahead and you done a degree in uh, geochemistry. What was that like? So I started my degree because I was really passionate about chemistry. Yeah. I wanted to be a chemist. I really love chemistry. I was this like classic high school nerd. And, yeah. um, you know, even my holidays, I, I studied a bit of chemistry. Oh, I was shocking at chemistry. Absolutely yeah. shocking. Yeah. And subhanAllah, I was really good at it because I had that passion. So that was something that I learned that I could actually, if I focus on something and if I studied it in the right way, I could do very well. I topped, I topped uh, chemistry in my first year of university. Oh. And... Then I realized, look, chemistry, and, and this was sort of maybe like a dunyary thing, but I was mm. like, chemistry, there's no jobs in Australia. Mm. Do something realistic. And for me, that was geochemistry. You know, I like going outside, I like nature. And it just made sense to do something that had better job prospects in Australia. Mm -hmm. So I said, that's pretty interesting as well. That's like a sub-branch of chemistry. So I took that on as a, as a major. And yeah, I continued to study it. And Alhamdulillah, I even did a, a research year. And I ended up, alhamdulillah, with the university medal in it. But SubhanAllah, just a humble brag, mashallah, that's really good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But for me, what, what I found is that, uh, you know, I, I was really going into uh, an academic career. Mm -hmm. So I, I was really into it. And I'm, I was basically, if you ask me in my first few years of university, I'm like, definitely, I'm going to do my PhD and then I'll be a postdoc. And then, you know, I want to be a professor somewhere. Mm -hmm. Or that, that, was, that was what I wanted. I even like said, you know, I want to I wanna aim and, you know, I'm going to get the Rhodes Scholarship. I'm going to study in Oxford. And, you know, I, I, had the, I had that sort of ambition in the early stage. 
And it sort of just shifted because I, I realized that academia is a very, very tough gig in that you could spend your whole life slaving away and just writing really, really poor papers, but you're forced to write them anyway and have very little contribution to, to that sort of field. And on the other side, I had my, my hobby, which was Arabic, which was something that I was, I was getting good at, that I enjoyed. And I just saw, you know, we have such a big gap in our Muslim community in terms of what do I want to spend my life doing? And I, I'm a really big advocate of focusing on something so that you can do it well. You know, we have so many things that we need to do well. And I said, look, I'm just going to slowly start to make a transition away from this and, and I want to focus more on Arabic. Just it was, it was sort of like my individual interest, something that I wanted to personally be good at, but this is the change I want to have in the, the, the Ummah or at least in our Sydney community. You know, mm -hmm. there needs to be more effort put into teaching Arabic, teaching it in the right way, learning about the right ways to teach Arabic and, you know, how to do it in the most efficient way. And, you know, ultimately it's a very big goal. You know, mm -hmm. it has very, very big tangible outcomes. And uh, for me, that was like sort of, um, it wasn't a no-brainer because it was a very hard decision for me to sort of uh, make a complete transition and, and sort of throw away my initial degree in the sense of, uh, that I didn't pursue uh, either a academia or I didn't pursue the industry. But uh, for me, it, alhamdulillah, there's no regrets. It's, pers it's definitely the right decision that I made in the sense that there's a need for it. There aren't really that many people that are living up to it or trying to take up that challenge. And it's a challenge. Mm. And um, th there, are, there are so many shortcomings. Just even in the way that we do teach Arabic now, it's not done to the to the way that like to a level of ihsan. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, one of the things generally Muslims have, have have done is that we've let the ball go and we've let the West take away in in terms of academia, look, doing research, working out the best practice of things. So if we look at la language learning, we're not teaching languages according to how they should be taught according to the experts in in teaching language and language acquisition. Yeah. I think that's so important, Ihsan, the concept of Ihsan, like we really need to make sure that we're putting this Ihsan and to come from someone of your background, who's, you know, achieving first in the grade at university, getting a gold medal in university, these things are very important that we get our brightest people. And I don't mean to like praise you to your face, but we need to make sure that when we do want to teach the Arabic language, we're getting bright people to teach it. And also people that are, I guess, passionate at the same time to make sure that when we do teach it, it's getting there to the people because it's so important for for so many of our youth to learn Arabic language. Like we we have Arabs, but they they don't even know how to speak Arabic, mm. or they might speak like that lahji, the 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 ami, the 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 colloquial Arabic. But tell them to read the Quran, it's very difficult. Yeah, and I actually have a have a bit of a goal, or I've worked out the vision because learning any language uh, as a second language or third language or and so forth is very challenging. It's a long process, it takes time, it takes a lot of effort, and there's a very, very low success rate. Just in any language, if you're learning French or German, it's the same. So basically, I have this vision, and it's a long-term long vision that I believe we as an Ummah need to work towards. And that is that we need to get people that can speak proper, like modern standard Fusha Arabic, and that are committed to speaking it more. Mm. So really, we should be speaking more just in our everyday interactions, and particularly speaking it in our own homes. Mm. And that allows the next generations, the future generations, to pick it up as a native language. You know, there's this specific, specific effort to speak speaking Arabic, and that allows a whole generation to be grown up uh, with that as a free language. Wow. And that allows them to reach higher levels. Because Arabic isn't this thing, you know, I, I, I sort of see that I had a late start, and if I compare just my Arabic ability to some of my classmates, I can't compare with them. They're so much more natural. They, they have this amazing vocabulary. They can express themselves in ways that I can't. Oh. So I want, I want my children to be able to express themselves in a much better way in Arabic, have it in a much more natural, flowy way. And that, that automatically rolls on to an increase of, in your understanding of the Quran, in the connection that you have and you know, allows you to dive deeper. No, that's very true, I guess, especially with our new generation that are coming along, I guess, English is going to be a given, you know, living in Australia or living in a Western country where English is the norm, it's going to be a given. So why not put this extra exerted effort into making sure that Arabic is there as well? SubhanAllah, it's so important. Mm -hmm. um, Mukhlis, you said that you liked going out, 
nature, this, that. This is why you've done geochemistry. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that. I see your posts here and there doing hikes, 12 kilometers, 10 kilometers. I don't know how long your longest hike has been, but what's that been like? Yeah, so basically when you read the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spends a lot of time in the Quran talking about his own creation. Mm. He says, you know, Fasil. look at this. Yeah, that's right. And there are so many ayats and all of those are designed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be ways that you increase your yaqeen, the increase that increases your belief. But the reality is that we live in our concrete jungles in the cities and we don't allow ourselves to have access to that as much. Sure, there is a little bit of, you know, you see trees around, there are, you, can, you see the sun every you day, you can see the sky. The <laughs> but really, and, and because we live in such busy lives, we don't, we don't give ourselves time. To, to think about those, to be, to be affected by these. Mm. So that's why, you know, alhamdulillah, I spent a, a bit of time going out and just hiking and spending time with nature, trying to get more other brothers to do that, going out camping, you know, just spending the night, you know, away from lights and technology. And, you know, it has such a, a therapeutic benefit. I enjoy it so much. Mm. But I feel like as a, as a devout Muslim, it's something that we need to do. Mm. I totally agree with you. I think even like, I think two nights ago, we just had the winter solstice, the longest night in, in, in Australia, in the Southern Hemisphere. And when you look out at the sky on those nights, particularly, they say the sight of the stars is more splendid than, than usual. And I looked at the stars the other night and I'm like, wow. Yeah, but is, this incredible. is in the city with, with so much light pollution, yeah. you can't see it properly. Yeah. You need to go out where there's no light and the stars are just, you know, the zina. That's as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it in the Quran, you know. It's a beauty, like a, like a splendor, subhanAllah. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful thing. Even I remember, I think one of the sheikhs, um, they noted that they went to the observatory in Sydney mm -hmm. to, to see the moon, to do moon sighting or something like that. And they said that the, the responsible, the, the principal of the observatory, when he saw the sheikh come in with his abaya and with his Islamic sunnah hat, Apparently he started crying from happiness. He's like, because of your religion, because of people like you, we know all this. And it's, it just goes to show you, you know, the, 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 the history, the rich history of Muslims in terms of gazing at the stars, learning about the stars, learning about the environment, learning about the mountains. And it all comes back to what? The Quran. Yeah. You know, for me, I always have this thing where I come from a science background and you know, there should be some sort of relationship between our understanding of these things and, and um, you know, being able to understand Allah's signs better. Mm. So, you know, I come from a sort of geology background. I can, I can say a little bit more about mountains and understand a little bit more about it. But for really, it's, a, it's a something that I, I haven't dwelled into too much. And, oh. um, you know, inshallah, I want to. And it's something that we generally have to do, not as a proof. So I think that's where we fell into a bit of a trap. I would have actually said that. It would have been a great project for you, you know, yeah. science of the Qur'an. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, it's not a straight proof because you can't, you can't use science in that way as a proof mm. of the Qur'an or of the truth of Islam. But it's just a sign. It's, me it's meant to make you think. Uh, yeah, and, right. you know, for you to think about these things requires you to have a, a better understanding of it as well. SubhanAllah, that would be a great project for you to, to take on The examples of geology within the Qur'an That would be a great project for you to take on inshallah mm, Inshallah khair um, Mukhlis, it's been a great time talking with you I, I really, really appreciate your contribution I, I hope that our viewers got the inspiration they got from listening to my brother I know Mukhlis, he does encourage me He does inspire me to constantly learn Arabic Constantly improve my Arabic And inshallah, and to give a plug We actually have an Arabic series coming out with Mukhlis very soon Teaching all our viewers inshallah How to improve their Arabic So thank you everyone for watching I hope you enjoyed it And until next time Jazakallah khairan Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah If you enjoy our content Please consider going over to our website At onepathnetwork.com and contribute whatever you can. Any donation will be greatly appreciated. Jazakallah khairan and thank you very much.